on sharing, because we like to share. And sharing is caring. I want to share the musings that I had and that led to it, as well as the research tools that I used. One fall a couple of years ago, I was driving through the lulling expanses of Iowa cornfields. It was harvest time in the fall, and I was watching the combines, and watching the combines got me to thinking of another agricultural tool, the plowshare. Now, a plowshare is a, a hardened blade attached to a mold board, and it's used for tilling the earth on the other side of the planting season. The phrase, beating swords into plowshares, came into my mind first. It's familiar from Isaiah 2, this lovely prophetic passage about eternal peace that says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. There's a beautiful statue representing this image, by the way, at the United Nations headquarters in New York City, an organization devoted to international peace. I got to thinking about the share part of the word. Plowing is breaking up the earth to plant seeds, but what's the share part all about? I imagined a scenario in which early frontier farmers time-shared their farming equipment, maybe because they were so poor. Mm, that doesn't sound very likely. And then I started playing what I call the cognate game, thinking of similar-sounding words that have similar meanings. And a good rule of thumb in playing the cognate game, by the way, is to focus on consonants and to ignore the vowels. Consonants have a certain staying power, more than vowels. Vowels are more liquidy. They, they come and go over time and between places. I call that part of the game spin the vowel. So the first words into my mind were shears, and the verb to shear, which means to cut, and that's exactly what a plow does. It cuts the earth. And since I know German, I immediately went to the noun die Schere in German, which means scissors, and of course the noun cognate in English, shears, which we use more for shearing sheep or, or possibly for an overgrown hedge. And what do hedges and sheep's wool become when shorn? They become short. Well, what else is sh short because of cutting? Well, if you're cutting cloth, maybe a shirt. We're still in the sh and er family. And I thought about how sh in English can be related to sk in other languages. So how about skirt? And what is a generic word for something that has been cut off or cut short? A shard. And then my brain started wandering further afield. What if the cutting involves land, like an entire country getting cut up? How about shire, the English word for country in Britain and the home of Bilbo and Frodo Baggins? And I thought about the word sheriff and how the word sheriff comes from shire plus the word reeve, a reeve is a sort of local magistrate or official. Chaucer has one tell a tale in his Canterbury Tales. And thinking about a sheriff got me thinking about the phrase settling the score. And I thought, oh, a score. We usually think of that as getting a point in a game or to score a goal. But originally it was to score as in to cut a notch or a mark to keep track of something like points in a game. What if those score marks are made on a body? What do they leave? A scar. How about this? If there are divisions in land called shires, how about where the land is divided from the ocean? How about the shore? Ooh, and here's another one. This one might be going out on a limb. It's spelled different, but what matters when you're talking about etymology is the sound of language. That's always primary, never the written conventions. What about the word sure itself? If you're sure of something, then haven't you cut off a firm line between true and false in your mind? Actually, I'm not very sure about that one. And that brings us back to my first theory that early farmers shared the plow. That's not very plausible. But the word share itself does belong on this list of cognates or related words because it refers to another kind of cutting. If you share a piece of pie, you're cutting it in half. And if you're sharing a toy, you're cutting the time segments in which you use that toy. 
So maybe share really is related to plowshare. Etymological musings like this are a great way to pass the time, especially on road trips. One other time while doing yard chores, I remember, watering and mowing, I got to thinking about the word throttle. Throttle, 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 throat, throat. Oh, it is kind of like the throat where the fuel-air mixture goes into the engine. Throttle, throttle, nozzle, nozzle, nozzle. Almost rhymes. That same strange ending. Nozzle, nizzle, nozzle, nozzle, no, nose, ooh, nose. So I wonder, is a throttle just a throat on a boat? And is a nozzle just a nose on a hose? And it turns out, yes, to the best of our knowledge, that's exactly what they are. But how do we know these things? And what do I even mean by words being related to each other? Having family resemblances. We'll return to our farm and yard musings later in the lecture, but first we need to talk about this whole family tree metaphor for words. Let's start with a basic idea. Words can be or seem related pretty much for three reasons. First, they've been in English for a long time and they derive from a single common ancestor, which split up, and though the different versions have changed a bit in sound or meaning over time, they still bear a family resemblance to one another, like that Habsburg nose. You see it there? It's in all the portraits from European history. The hair color could change, the eye color could change, but you just cannot get away from that nose. The second possibility is, again, they descend from a common ancestor, but they spent time like different cousins in the Habsburg family, growing up in different countries. But eventually, they all made their way to English. The third possibility is it's just a coincidence. It would be an example of what a biologist as well as linguists call convergent evolution. It's like the shark and the dolphin. Sharks and dolphins look a lot alike. Children confuse them from time to time. But we know that sharks are fish and dolphins are mammals. So the similarity is a result of them adapting to the similar environments that they both live in. So that rather than retaining some ancestral characteristic, they're more like basically unrelated creatures that have come to bear a superficial resemblance. Words can do that too. So later in the lecture, we'll find out which of my musings about share words are in fact related to each other, and which of them are sharks in the dolphin tank. Before we dive into the wonderful world of cognates and Proto-Indo-European roots, pause the lecture now and take a few minutes to do your own etymological musing, or maybe more than a few minutes. For the best luck, start with some common monosyllabic word and place spin the vowel, leaving the consonants in place, and see what you come up with. Don't expect every attempt to pan out. There are a lot of dead ends, but practice thinking this way. Normally, we, we go from one word to another word, either grammatically in a sentence or alphabetically in a dictionary. Try going from word to word etymologically. Loosen up. Think creatively. See what you come up with. All right, you're back. I hope you enjoyed mulling your way through English. Now let's talk about our next field, historical linguistics. People have known for millennia that words were related, that they came in family trees, but for most of those millennia, the knowledge was basically speculative. The field, or I'd say the, the science of historical linguistics, began with this handsome fellow you're looking at, Sir William Jones, who lived in the 18th century. He was British. He was a linguistic prodigy. By the end of his life, he was fluent in 13 languages, and he could get around in another 28 or so. And he studied languages that were not commonly attended to in 18th century Enlightenment England, like Persian from Iran, and Arabic, and Chinese, and Turkish. And of course he knew Latin and Greek. Every educated person did. That was part of the, of the uh, college curriculum. He also attended to cultural and religious subjects that were not as common in his era. He was fascinated by Indian literature, and we're talking the South Asian subcontinent, India proper, Indian literature, culture, the Hindu religion. And he was a bit of a kind of global radical thinker. He also, in addition to being interested in Indian culture and religion, he supported America's independence from England. And he worked with Benjamin Franklin in France. Sir William found his life's work as a judge 
stationed in Bengal, which is more or less northern India. That's where he learned Sanskrit, the ancient language of Hinduism and a lingua franca understood throughout the Southeast Asian area. And that is when the magic happened. He started noticing similarities between Latin and Greek and Sanskrit. For instance, in Sanskrit, the word for three is trias. In Latin, it's tres. And in Greek, trias. The word for eight, ashta. In Sanskrit, octo. In Latin, octo, also in Greek. The word for snake or serpent, sarpa. In Sanskrit, serpens. In Latin, the word for king, raja. In Sanskrit, rex, regem. In Latin. To bring this concept closer to home, have a look at these two slide columns. On the left you have Spanish, which comes from Latin, so that's our stand-in for Latin in this comparison. And on the right you have Sanskrit. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. Eka, dva, tri, cator, pancha, seis, sapta, ashta, nava, das. It sounds similar, doesn't it? There's no way this is a coincidence. These have to be related. Based on his observations, Jones made this shocking statement to the Royal Asiatic Society of Calcutta in 1786. He said, The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful, that means admirable, marvelous, structure. It is more perfect in the sense of a finished or complete than Greek, more copious, meaning it can express more concepts than Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either. I don't really know what he means there, but here's the important bit. Yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, relatedness, both in the roots of the verbs and the forms of the grammar, than could possibly have been produced by accident. So strong indeed that no philologer, that's a lover of words, that's basically what I do for a living, could examine them, all three, without believing them to have sprung from some common source which, perhaps, no longer exists. This was a stunning claim to make. First of all, it was quite a revelation to the 18th century British, because languages generally follow people who speak languages. So if Latin and Greek, that's the, the languages of the great classical civilizations of Greece and Rome, the focus of Renaissance humanism, if they're related to Sanskrit, doesn't it follow that the white-skinned, Christian imperial overlords of colonial Britain were somehow genetically related to the brown-skinned Muslim and Hindu subjects of colonized India. That one took a while to sink in. Another impact of Jones's claim was that it set off a flurry that lasted at least a century and is still going on of historical linguistics that led to the development of comparative linguistics. That would be the scientific method of studying a word's etymology. And the grand result of all that studying was pi. And isn't it nice when things turn into pi? This pi is P-I-E, Proto-Indo-European. Jones had speculated that there was some ancestral language which might not exist anymore. And we believe he was dead on. And we call it Proto-Indo-European. Well, Sir William turned his attention to other matters and he died rather young. But just look at how many languages are gathered together into the family album of Proto-Indo-Europeans' descendants. I'd like you please to memorize this chart and be able to reproduce it in every detail the next time we see each other. No, just kidding. But do have a look over the languages, or maybe they're easier to see represented like this. This actually gives me warm, fuzzy feelings, because this was a picture that was posted on my bulletin board above my desk in college back when I was a math and physics major, and this poster represented that, that pull that language was beginning to exert over me that eventually won me away from the sciences and to the humanities. Or to see the scope of the Indo-European languages another way, check out this map. The dark green and light green areas represent countries in which people who speak a language that descends from that original Pi language is either the national language or an official language of the country. Well, let's tour some of these green places using the lucky number seven. Based on its forms in all the Indo-European languages, 
we have concluded that those pi people had a root septum. That asterisk, by the way, means that it is not recorded anywhere. That's what prehistoric means, right? It wasn't written down. It's been reconstructed. We'll talk about how in a minute. But first, behold the many forms of seven. These are Germanic languages. Old English, Seovon, seven in Middle English, seven in English, Frisian, that's a Dutch dialect, Sogen, seven, Afrikaans, that's the Dutch dialect spoken in South Africa, German Sieben, Pennsylvania Dutch, who are not Dutch, they're German. I'm not exactly sure how they say that. Swiss German, which is a dialect of German, Siebe. Yiddish, which is a kind of combination of German and Hebrew, Sieben, Norwegian, Siu. Danish, Swedish, Icelandic, Gothic. The Italic languages you might think of as the Romance languages, so starting with Latin Septem, which looks a lot like Sept. We have Portuguese, Spanish, Siete, Old French, Set, Zept, Occitan, which was a Southern French dialect, Languedocian, Italian, Set, and Romanian, Zapte. Slavic, which brings us into the Russian languages and, and the languages spoken in the former Soviet Union. Russian, Belarusian, White Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, where my ancestors are from, Czech, Slovak, Bulgarian, Macedonian, Slovene. Some of these languages are changing. We've got D's instead of P's, and M has crept in there, closer to the D in some of them, but it's still clearly related. Celtic, the languages of the British Isles and a little bit of the mainland. Again, we've, we've changed a little bit more, but not completely unrelated. Hellenic, Greek, not septa or septum, but hepta. Baltic, so going up north to Latvia and Lithuania. Septony and septony. That's in the family. Even Indo-Iranian, so this would be India and Iran. Kurdish, a people who span several countries. Haut, hafta in Farsi, the ancient language of Iran. Sanskrit, sapta. Hindi, zat. And Kashmiri, from the Kashmir region in between India and Nepal, Zat. Even Hittite, Shipta, is in the family. Well, if you're starting to say, well, some of those don't look exactly like Zeptum, check out these other words for seven from some non-Indo-European languages. And I'm not going to attempt to pronounce these. Oh, heck, it would be fun. Egyptian, Safksaw, Tibetan, Dhun, Hawaiian, Ehiku. Now we're in a completely other area, right? Greenlandic, Inuit, Arfinuk, Marluk, Passamaquoddy, Winnebago. These are Native American languages. Down to Korean, thanks to uh, Sanghee for uh, correcting this one. Uh, Ilgup, Vietnamese, Tom, Tagalog, Pito. Clearly, these are not in the same family as the Septum languages. For another example, take a minute and read down a couple of these columns. They represent the words for month, mother, new, night, nose, and three in the languages down the left-hand side. And you'll see that they bear a relatively close resemblance to one another. So you can go from Welsh to Spanish to Dutch to Romanian to Greek to Persian to Sanskrit, and you're still in the same family tree album. Take a moment and pause and read down a column. Before I mentioned that we reconstruct Proto-Indo-European roots, well, how exactly do linguists go about reconstructing a root that's not recorded anywhere? The field of comparative linguistics, which looks at this as its data, has developed a set of analytical techniques for figuring out what the Proto-Indo-European roots likely were. So let's take an example, one used by John McWhorter in his book Power of Babel, and go through it step by step. We're going to try and figure out the Proto-Indo-European root to reconstruct it for the word sister-in-law. And here are examples. This will be our data set. Sanskrit, snusa. Old English, English from about a thousand years ago, snoru. Russian, snocha. Latin, nurus. Greek, nuos. Armenian, nu. And Albanian, nuse. Let's decide first on what vowel comes first in the word after the initial consonant. We observe that five of them have a U and two of them have an O. So the first principle I can give you is, just like the American electoral system, majority rules. What's the reasoning behind this principle? Well, assuming that these words represent what happened to an original word, 
used by an ancient people, which then split up and went their separate ways, is it more likely that in five cases the vowel happened to shift from that original O to the same U, or that in two cases the original U shifted to an O? It's clearly the latter, because convergent evolution, that is two things coming to appear alike, is relatively uncommon. So our first vowel is U, and our first principle is the majority rules. Now let's move on to the first consonant sound. Three begin with SN, four begin with N. We've got a principle of majority rules, but before we apply that, let's think about linguistic processes. What is more likely? That an original Proto-Indo-European S wore off through the well-known process of sound erosion in several cases, or that people in, let's see, India, Russia, and England all independently added the same sound to the beginning of the word later in time. That sounds like a conspiracy theory to me. Not very likely. So the first consonant sound was likely SN, and the second principle is sounds erode, and that sound erosion is more common than convergent evolution, where independent mutations arrive at the same point. So the root began SNU. What was the second consonant then? Here we have a smattering of options. Three have S, still a little bit under a majority for seven. Two have R, one has KH, and one has nothing. We can explain Armenian nothing by sound erosion, and we can rule out the Russian KH as an outlier. And it just so happens that we can do one more thing. One thing that historical linguists have figured out is that in Latin, in early Latin, an S in certain environments could change into an R predictably, in later Latin. So if that's what happened here, we can count the R in Latin nurus as another S, giving us yet another S, and thus a clear majority. To know that, though, you have to know a few sound shifts. And by a few, I mean a vast and bewildering number, but we won't get into all of those. To complete our construction of snus something, we need to figure out the last sound. And here the data are the most complicated of all. Our final decision might be vowel versus consonant. Five of our words have a vowel, two of them have a consonant. And by majority rules, the vowel wins. And the vowels are A, U, A, U, and E. And A sounds like a good bet. And it's a smart bet because we know from other words that the A ending is feminine. That even holds true in American women's first names. Think of all the female first names that end with a vowel. Anna, Tara, Emma, or other vowels. Lily, Julie, Betty, Katie, Sally, Molly. The vowel ending is often feminine. And to quote Dr. McWhorter, at least in my personal experience, sisters-in-law tend to be women, but not so fast. Just like the A is a feminine ending, that U.S. and O.S. in Greek and Latin are masculine endings. We've got to account for those. Furthermore, the Armenian nu could easily have swallowed up what is a masculine ending in Armenian, which would be an o. It kind of got swallowed into that u. So we might have three cases of the word becoming masculine grammatically, because in these languages, words have grammatical gender as well as biological gender for some words. So how likely is it that the Romans, the Greeks, and possibly the Armenians all independently decided that sisters-in-law are masculine grammatically, if not biologically? That seems pretty hard to explain as three independent events. It would be much easier to accept that for some reason, lost in the sands of time, the word for sister-in-law, though that is clearly a biologically female person, was a grammatically male noun. And thus, this sort of aberration happened once, and the change to the feminine endings in snoru, snoka, nuse, or restoring grammatical gender to biological gender and changing the word to the female form. If that's the case, which McWhorter proposes, and I agree, it's most likely that the original Proto-Indo-European root for sister-in-law 
was snooze sos. And the principle here is, well, it's not really a principle. It's just the rule that it's messy and that there's some art and more than a little speculation in this science. So if I were to create a slide called methodology and outline the procedure for reconstructing Proto-Indo-European roots, it might give you these steps. Collect all the words for X, whatever it is you're studying, in all of the Indo-European languages. You'll also have to include words for related things because sometimes meanings change just like sounds do. In that last example, the last two words were actually for bride rather than sister-in-law, but there the meaning had wandered just as the sound had wandered. You're going to toss out any words that are clear borrowings from other languages. If you happen to be next to Hungary, where they do not speak an Indo-European language, and your word for sister-in-law is the same as the Hungarian word for sister-in-law, that's clearly a borrowing, and that can be tossed out of the data set. You're going to account for known sound shifts you're going to appreciate the power of sound erosion. You're ultimately going to come down to the rule of the majority in making your decisions. And you're going to begin your reconstruction when you write it down with an asterisk. Because just like all those baseball records that are on the books with an asterisk in front of them, because there was suspicion of doping or some other irregularity, it just reminds everyone that nowhere is there a stone tablet or a papyrus or a manuscript with this word written or carved into it. It is your reconstruction. So no matter how careful you've been, it remains speculation. It's now time to return to my musings on Plowshare. Let's look at some of my favorite reference works for studying these matters and see how accurate my musings were. Well, step one, always step one, is the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, the big dictionary on historical principles which contains every word that's ever been in English, including all the ones that have been left, with every meaning those words have had, including meanings that are no longer current, and that includes dates and illustrative quotations and lots and lots of etymological information. So I went and looked up the verb shear. Let's look at the information it gives us. After the IPA, both in British and United States English, we see the past tense form sheared, and shore, as well as shorn, and then looking at some abbreviations. O-E is Old English, shiron, because S-C in Old English said S-H, shiron. M-E is Middle English. The next line, M-E-15 and 16, is Middle English of the 15th century, of the 16th century. Down a few lines, we have 17 S-C, that's Scottish English in the 17th century, with some other forms, sure and shore. Ooh, and shard, those start to resemble some of the words I speculated were in this family, so I'm taking some hope from this. And then there's an etymology at the bottom. A common Germanic verb, the Old English form is scheren, the past tense is shear, past participle shoren, which corresponds to Old Frisian, that's an Old Dutch form, skera. Hey, there's an SK, which brings in the forms like skirt. There are fun languages that I had the pleasure of studying in college, like Old High German, Middle High German, as well as their modern German, Scher. Norse is in this Germanic family, too, as is Danish and Swedish. All of these languages from the, uh, the Netherlands through Germany up to Denmark to Norway and Sweden, they're all essentially dialects of the Germanic languages. They're uh, twigs on the Germanic branch of the Proto-Indo-European trunk. And down at the bottom, we see some confirmation of some of my guesses. We see share and shear and shard and score and shore. But on this list, I don't yet see shirt or shire or sure. So we have to keep looking. And I could look those words up in the OED, but I'm going to go to my number two source. And that source is always, in the middle, the American Heritage Dictionary. It's sitting right here on my desk. But it's also available online and for free. You can look it up at ahdictionary.com, as in AmericanHeritageDictionary.com, but I believe it's actually pronounced ahdictionary.com. The OED is also available online, but it requires a paid subscription. If you don't have one, you could look to your local library or check out a local college, which likely does. Well, under share, 
two, the ah dictionary lists plowshare. And it gives us this critical, crucial piece of information, a link there in purple to the Proto-Indo-European root in an appendix, which I have in the back of my dictionary, but which you can link to and search in the online version. This is brilliant. It's almost like Sir William Jones riding up to your desk on horseback, presenting you with centuries of linguistic etymological wisdom on a silver platter and saying, open, take, and read. I'm almost too scared to look, but let's see what this link has to offer. On top, there's the care, which we saw from Lithuanian, and the essential meaning is to cut. And here's some interesting derivative. Shears, scabbard, ooh, interesting, skirmish, a division between two sides in war, carnage, and through some transformations that we won't begin to trace, sharp, scrape, and screw. Basic forms, scare and care. There are more usages than just the eight ABC that I've given you, but let's go through these. There's confirmation of many of our words, shear and share, and the German scher, and there's score, and there's scar. Oh, and there's one I hadn't even considered, scarf from the Old Norse with that SK sound, and scarf in two senses. A scarf is something else cut out of cloth. It's another divided cloth, like a shirt and a skirt. Also, I'm a woodworker, and in woodworking, when you're going to end join two boards, one thing you'll often do is cut a scarf joint, and that's where you angle or bevel the end of both of the boards so that there's more gluing surface or more joining surface. It's used in shipbuilding a lot, a scarf joint. There's a scar, and there's shard, and there's short, and there's shirt, and there's skirt. So what's missing here? Shire, shore, and sure. Well, I did some more digging, and it looks like shire might have come from a late Latin form of cura, which gives us the word care, as in it's the area that's entrusted to the care of it, well, of a sheriff, essentially, of a shire reeve. So shire, as fun as that was, you're out of the family, and sheriff along with it. For sure, the venerable Oxford English Dictionary gives us this. Etymology, Middle English, sure, from, that's what the, it doesn't mean less than, it means from, or cognate with Middle Low German, schor, and probably from the root of shear. That was, my specula that was my speculation, but the etymological notion is not easy to determine. It may perhaps be division between land and water. Well, what that essentially says is that we've reached the frontier of knowledge, and given the evidence that's come down to us through history, we can't determine for certain whether shor belongs in the family or not, so it's clear that others have had that same musing. Other dictionaries in this case would use the abbreviation OOO. It stands for of obscure origin. But I like to say it just as it stands. OOO. It's like an onomata poetic etymological cry of limit. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Finally, to my long shot the word sure, where you're cutting truth off from falsehood. And no, this one does not pan out. Sure comes from, in the etymology, French, which comes from Latin securus. Ah, which gives us secure security. You're sure if you're secure in your opinion. Ah, that makes perfect sense. Oh, and the reason, reason why there's so much of secure, the Latin word missing, in sure, is that it came to us via French. It's like the French basically took Latin and said, I, I do not feel like pronouncing all of you. I should only take a little bit, a little bit. So they keep the sure, pass that on to us. The word probably came over on Norman French boats in about 1066 with William the Conqueror and landed in Middle English. So let's tally up. Of my musings, share, sheer, sheer, shears, short, shirt, skirt, shard are in but Shire is out, and along with it, Sheriff. Score is in. Sure, we're not sure of. And sure, we are sure of. And it's out. And Shire is a shark in the tank. It's convergent evolution. It came to look like our SH vowel R words, but it's a shark, not a dolphin. Sheriff, likewise, and also for sure. These are sharks that look like dolphins swimming along in the cornfields of Iowa.